Hello, everybody, and welcome to the National Patient Advocate Foundation um, Policy Consortium, Identity and the Healthcare Experience. So during this, pot, during this consortium, we are going to be um, focusing on how the, way, the ways in which our, our, how we identify ourselves and how others identify ourselves, identify us, influence our healthcare experience, both positively and negatively. We're gonna hear, we'll discuss the impact of racial, gender, and cultural identities on access to healthcare, treatment, and health equity. And we'll not only explore and talk about what we're doing, but we like these policy consortiums to be very action oriented. So we'll talk about what health equity and equitable health system looks like. And we will also talk about um, how we can, what, what are the action steps we can take to ensure that that, um, to ensure that we have an equitable health system for all. I'm sorry. So I wanted to start out by um, by just talking about some of the themes that we'll that we'll hear in this policy consortium, and also the themes that that and pull out some quotes from some of our speakers. We are thrilled that Isabel Wilkerson, the author of *Cast: The Origins of Our Discontents*, has agreed to be our keynote speaker. Um, Ms. Wilkerson is also the author of *Warmth of Other Suns*, and so. When I think about how we really framed this policy consortium, which builds on many other many other consortia that we've done in our work, we really I really think about this framing from um, Isabel Wilkerson about the tyranny of caste. The tyranny of caste is that we are judged on the things we cannot change: a chemical in the epidermis, the shape of one's facial features, the signposts on our bodies of gender and ancestry superficial differences that have nothing to do with who we are inside. And you'll hear this from both, you'll hear this theme throughout the entire policy consortium, both from, um, from personal experiences that people or speak, speakers will have, as well as their research and the, um, the research and the um, community activities and action that they undertake. So identity, as we know, has a deep and pervasive influence on how we interact with the healthcare system and how this healthcare system interacts with us. My colleague, Chris Wilson, um, who you will see on the screen soon, um, in a blog post about defining identity in healthcare, um, wrote this. In this country, identity has a direct impact on access to and quality of care. People can be denied care because of their race or ethnicity, because they are poor or uninsured, or because their identity somehow is counter to someone's cultural, religious, or political beliefs, or their life choices or lives have led to difficult healthcare problems. Too often, the assumptions lie just beneath the surface. And this is, again, something that you'll hear as a theme throughout. Um, there are some incredibly moving and riveting stories and discussions, and also re and, and very strong calls to action. And sometimes the assumptions lie just beneath the surface, and sometimes they are extremely, um, they are right on the surface yelling in our faces. So one of the, one of the things that we do as we lead up to pot, the, pot, um, the policy consortia is that we do a series of, of podcasts. And this is an excerpt from a podcast by Zinzi Bailey, who is a social, social ep epidemiologist called Breaking Connections That Lead to Inequities. So this is about the impact of identity on healthcare, treatment, and health equity. When I'm talking about inequities and disparities, I'm really talking about further upstream to the social systems of racism, classism, heterosexism, ableism, things that are driving the pattern and distribution of our living conditions that we're seeing in our population. So we'll talk about both individual experiences, um, family experiences, community experiences, and system change. So I wanted to, um, I, I wanted to dedicate this policy consortium to my beloved friend, 
um, the late Mary Jackson Scroggins, who some people call Dicey, I think, um, but a few of her very close friends never quite made that leap. Um, Mary died on August 1st of a secondary cancer, which was a late effect of her first cancer. Um, she is was is was beloved and is beloved by many, many people, and she impacted so many lives of patients, advocates, families, and communities. She was a fierce advocate for global women's health and a leader in promoting health equity and an extraordinary mentor to patient advocates who came after her. One of Mary's, um, one of the things that we've discussed often was how we had to, how we had to help bring others into the field of patient advocacy and train them and then step aside and give them, a, give them a place, give them a seat at the table, not just simply take all the seats for ourselves. So social justice cannot prevail where conscious or unconscious discrimination is allowed to reside on unchallenged. I think that would be it really, if I, if I were to describe Mary's work in one way, this is the way, this is where, this is how I would describe it. This is what she focused on. She focused on social justice and she focused on health equity. And Mary and I worked together for probably 25 years as friends, colleagues, um, co-troublemakers. Um, and this is an excerpt from a, from a um, piece that we wrote in spring 2008 called The Influence of Dr. Bias. And what I also, what I also wanted to highlight on this, um, about this piece is in this piece in spring of 2008, we talked about um, how we had been having these conversations about healthcare disparities for more than, for us, for more than 10 years since we started working in advocacy. And we kept on having the same conversations over and over and over, which is why we really want to make this act. We want to, we want to illuminate the path. We want to make sure that we have a shared understanding of the past, but we also really want to lay the groundwork for, um, for the future. So this is a quote from our piece, forces and factors other than purely socioeconomic ones are at work in health disparities, and any hope for change requires honest, thorough investigation of them all. Perhaps more important, change requires action. Appropriate interventions and sanctions is warranted. These are not easy or comfortable to contemplate or to do, but then substandard care is neither easy to live with nor easy to die from. And our commitment must be to individual patients, not to a system or to members of that system who do not do them justice. So Mary's challenge to us all is really the challenge of this policy consortium to us all. And through her writing, her speaking, and her presence, Mary always challenged her friends and colleagues and worked with her friends and colleagues to think differently about health and equity and to do more to ensure a just and healthcare system and do that all a lot alongside of her. Um, her death from cancer redoubles that challenge and her um, and her inspiration and her legacy is um, is one of the is just inspires us all to keep on doing this work. So I wanted to quickly go through the agenda. You'll see um, we have a very rich and full agenda. We could have gone on for many more hours, but we decided we'd only try to have you for um, four hours. And and uh, so um, our first speaker I'll in introduce in a minute is Isabel Wil Wilkerson. Then we have a video of Vince Bonham and his lab on cultivating an ethos of diversity, creating an anti-racist scientific experience. Um, an excerpt from our podcast, Partnering by Invitation Only by Katie Cueva. And then I will be moderating a panel called Identity in the Healthcare Experience with um, Rachel Grubb, Brenda Lee Rodriguez, and Sh Sherry Flint Wallington. Um, we have a riveting and moving video by Adrienne Moore, Dying to be Heard about her experience um, trying to get access to healthcare. Um, and then a um, a data presentation because we build all these policy consortiums of what we're learning from the patients that we serve on at Patient Advocate Foundation called Patient Reported Discrimination Among Limited Resource Cancer Survivors. 
And then at the end, our colleague, our friends and colleagues, Kellen Baker, and whoops, I went back, sorry, Reggie Tucker Seeley, um, will talk to do a do a summary and a call to action, translating um, talk into action. I'll do a brief summary, and then we will end the day with um, an excerpt from Zinzi Bailey's podcast. So before I think, so I'd like to. Um, Thank our thank our team. Thank you to the patient advocacy, engagement, and education team, which is the team the team that puts that puts on this um, these policy consortia. I want to give an, a special thanks to Ashley Freeman and Chris Wilson. Um, Ashley um, Ashley and Chris were um, developed this agenda and um, developed the content for this. Um, for this program along with me and Ashley, as I mentioned earlier, we have podcasts. We are in our sixth season. We just finished our sixth season and Ashley is our host and podcast producer and please listen to the podcast. They are, they are, um, they are, they are really inspiring and really, um, and really give many different perspectives on access, on how people access the healthcare system. Chris Wilson is the, um, Chris Wilson um, produced the video with Adrian Moore, and you'll see how beautifully um, Chris produced that video. Um, and then I'd also like to thank Katie um, Donovan, who is responsible for the, for um, a tremendous outreach to ensure that the, um, this policy consortium that is touching on such critical issues has a deep and um, a deep and a, and a wide um, distribu no distribution and knowledge of this podcast, uh, knowledge of this um, policy consortium and podcast. Um, and then I want to thank you to our policy consortium speakers, Novartis, Lilly, Bristol Myers Squibb, Takeda, Pfizer, Johnson and Johnson. They are our members without, without whom we could not do these, this, pro this project.